Coming up on iOS Today, Rosemary Orchard and I are joined by special guest Sawyer Blatz, the creator of the Nudget Spending Tracker in the App Store. The app was recently featured, and we talked to Sawyer about the design of the app, what led him to create it, and where things might go from there. Plus, we talk about Apple working on a MagSafe battery pack, maybe, uh, the EU warning Apple to treat all apps fairly. We answer several questions, including one about switching an iPad in for a computer, and we talk about our app picks of the week. It's all that plus so much more coming up on iOS Today. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by Babbel. Babbel has made learning new languages fun and easy with bite-sized lessons that you'll actually use in the real world. Purchase a three-month Babbel subscription and get an additional three months free. Go to babbel.com and use promo code iOS today. Hello and welcome to iOS Today, the show where we talk about all things iPhone, Apple Watch, uh, iPad, Apple TV, HomePod, HomePod Mini. I'm just naming all the devices uh, because we talk about quite a few of them here on iOS Today. And folks, I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent, and I am excited to say that Rosemary Orchard is back today. Welcome back, Rosemary. We missed you. Thank you. I miss being on the show, but unfortunately, last week was unfortunately not a week I could be here. <laughs> <laughs> and understood. Uh, we had Dan Morin in uh, for for you, and it was a, a really good episode. We, um, uh, you know, Dan is a writer, and uh, so I was wanting originally to talk to him about writing, uh, but we had just talked about writing and kind of document creation apps. And so um, he and I both like kind of word puzzles and puzzle games and things like that. So we ended up talking about puzzle games last week. It was um, it was a puzzling episode of iOS Today. Uh, but this week, we have a very interesting episode. It's a little different. Um, I think the last time we did an episode like this was... Uh, was Leo Laporte and Megan Maroney um, when they had a an app developer on the show. And so we decided today to bring on an app developer to chat with us. Uh, so I want to welcome to the stage Sawyer Blatz, the creator of the Nudget Budget app. Hello, Sawyer. Hey, everyone. It is good to have you here. Um, so this is – first, I think the, the best thing that we can do is kind of talk about um, what your app is and what it does. Uh, and then we can we can kind of break into things. But the reason why um, we wanted to have you on is because uh, your app was recently featured in the App Store, um, which is, is a whole process. It involves artwork and all these kinds of things. And um, I know you just released, you know, a, an update to the app and, and you'd been working on it for a while. But let's start with what your app is. Kind of give everybody the pitch of this app that they should check out called Nudget. Yeah, so um, Nudget is basically this uh, personal finance application that uh, really just helps you get a handle on your um, budgeting. And really, it's meant for like beginners at budgeting. It's really supposed to um, make it super easy to just like uh, understand like high level concepts about your budgeting, you know, like um, where your money is going the most, um, where uh, maybe your spending has gone up or down recently and things like that. Um, and so I really tried to make it super, super approachable to people um, just to be able to get those uh, high level concepts that maybe a lot of other apps, you know, they kind of drown you in, in all these like spreadsheets and, and too much information. Right. And so um, I really wanted to make it uh, super simple to, to get the things you care about. Yeah. And I think that you, you definitely hit the nail on the head there. One of the things that immediately is striking about the app is its design. And so I wanted to start there because, you know, we've got an audience here for iOS today that's not 
incredibly dev heavy. Uh, and in fact, now I'm realizing maybe even saying dev is, is a little too far developer <laughs> heavy. Um, and so it, I, I want to talk about uh, some of the kind of high level concepts, of course, but also one of the things that sticks out is the design. Um, so you, you should tell us a little bit about kind of your, your path because you were, an Android developer uh, <laughs> at one point, and I think not not that now. Um, but where did design kind of factor into that? So yeah, start with with kind of your your path, and then talk about how um, you learned uh, the design skills that you have, because I think you designed a very good looking app. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I actually started out with iOS development back in 2015. Um, and it was kind of when I went around like um, Apple was releasing Swift, um, which basically was just like a really simple um, programming language that made it really easy to um, kind of for a bunch of like new developers to jump in and not feel super intimidated by it. Um, and so that's really when I got my start. Um, and I kind of just like worked on little like projects that like never got actually released, you know, or like had like maybe like four downloads on the app store. Like I did the thing that everyone does where like I made a weather app and things like that. Um, and um, yeah, I did get the opportunity to work on Android. Um, I worked at Mozilla for a little bit um, and got to kind of build out my, my mobile experience in general, which was super interesting because um, there's just a lot of things that, you know, I... I am an iOS user myself, and so obviously, like, <laughs> I am biased and and partial to uh, liking iOS more. But um, there's a lot of things that Android does differently, and it's kind of cool to like, you know, hey, maybe there are some cool things I can pull in from like what Android does well and stuff like that. So that's been a really cool opportunity for me to kind of um, just broaden my horizons a bit. Um, but yeah, I, I am back on iOS now, and um, it's funny because um, I never really consider myself a designer um and it's something that like i nudge it was kind of my like you know my opportunity to grow the skill because i had never really had the chance to like you know sit down and really work on this thing um you know in my day job i'm just like coding and stuff like that right and like you have a little bit of influence on those sorts of things but it's a lot harder when like you know, there's people that are professionally trained in this thing and it's like, <laughs> okay, they probably know what they're talking about. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's been super cool to like, um, I, I've heard that comment a lot of like, oh, I really like the design of Nudget. And it's just like, every time I hear it, it warms my heart because I'm like, oh yay. Like I'm actually, um, I think I am starting to learn this a little bit more and starting to feel a little bit more comfortable that like, maybe I know a little bit what I'm doing now, you know? Um, but yeah, it's really been a process. Like the, the initial like app was not pretty at all. Like <laughs> it looked really bad. Um, and yeah, it, it just took like a lot of iterating and a lot of just like, um, getting inspiration from like what other apps do well and like what, um, what I, what I come to an app for and things like that. So yeah, it's been, it's been really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, so then let's, let's talk about, uh, you know, we, we've got the design uh, figured out. We've got, you know, kind of your switch or your your movement through uh, the different developer systems. Um, so creating an app that is for uh, budget tracking, but as you say, it's kind of, uh, and, and I think the website says something along the lines of, you know, budget tracking for the rest of us. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Was this born out of frustration with the other apps? Was this uh, born out of, of you wanting to create something just for yourself and then uh, you'd realize that you wanted it to be available for other people? Uh, what was the kind of the driver behind? Because I think maybe people don't realize based on how uh, quickly, you know, you, you get Oh, something's wrong with this app and I'm upset about it. I think people maybe don't realize how involved it is to create an app. And so for you to, to want to make something and then continue to work on it and iterate on it is no small commitment. So what was the, the thing that kept you sticking to it? And what was the thing that, that, you know, made you want to make this in the first place? 
Yeah. So definitely just want to like plus one what you said about like it is a huge amount of work, um, especially when, you know, you have a day job and there's other things you want to do with your life. Like it is a huge time commitment to um, to work on an app. So, yeah, it definitely was something that I had to be really passionate about and excited about. Um, and so for me, that was like, you know, how do I what's like something I care out care about a lot? And it was um like finance for me is just something I find really interesting. Um, it was originally born out of like, I really need to be keeping track of things like in college, like I didn't have a super huge budget. Right. And so I like needed to be really particular about like where I'm spending money and stuff like that. Um, and that kind of just like flourished into this like, um, idea of like, you know, it, it was a little bit born out of like frustrations with other apps. Like, um, I, I, I know a lot of people use things like mint where like you, you know, it automatically tracks your spending and like all this stuff. And like that never really worked super well for me for a couple of reasons. One was like, it always categorized things incorrectly for me. And like, (laughs) especially someone who like uses Venmo a bunch, like with my partner, like it was just like Venmo a million dollars, you know? And it's like, okay, (laughs) well that doesn't really help me. Right. Like, um, what does that, what, what were those Venmos? Right. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I, you know, I wish there were like a better solution there. Um, maybe one day that'll get figured out. But, um, the other thing was like the, then the apps that did a lot of manual entry were super slow to like actually enter an expense, you know? And so, you know, in the before times when we could like actually go out places, um, (laughs) when, (laughs) when you like would be at a restaurant or like be out with friends shopping or something like that. And you like wanted to enter an expense, it was like taking you through seven different screens or like you just had to like tap a bunch of different options. And like when you're out and about, like you just want to like get it done with. Right. And so that was a really big uh, motivator for me with Nudge. It was like, hey, I want to make it super, super fast to enter an expense. So as soon as you open the app, the keyboard's right there to enter your expense. Um, I tried to make it like literally two or three taps. Right. So it's just like, boom, you're done and, and you can get back to whatever you're doing in your life that you care about that's not <laughs> keeping track of your money right right um and yeah so i think that was kind of where the motivation came from for me um and yeah the the final thing i'll say is like my my partner was actually a motivating factor because he was someone who didn't really track a lot of his budgeting things right um you know he he was like whatever i'll just like it'll figure itself out right <laughs> right um and <laughs> so yeah that was like kind of a challenge for him like ooh, can i make something where like he'll actually use it and actually care about it maybe like not as much as me because like i'm a geek about it right but like maybe he'll you know take to using it and and he is now a regular user so mission accomplished nice <laughs> good work good work well uh so sorry one of the things i've noticed um which is a topic near and dear to my heart is the support for shortcuts in nudget now i love shortcuts and i know that there were those features that some some developers sort of skip over and think oh maybe this isn't worth it and i was wondering how do you go about um you know deciding what features are worth importing and including in an app like nudget and and what Is it based on user demand and requests or is it based on your personal interests or a little bit of both? Yeah, I would say it's definitely a bit of both. Um, I think it it definitely originally was like users requesting it because, um, you know, I I use shortcuts a little bit, but I'm definitely not like a fanatic. Um, And so (laughs) it was definitely like something where it's like, hey, I want to be able to like um, do this big like automation flow like where I'm you know, whenever I write something down, I want it to also go to nudge it and do all these other things. I'm like, super cool, more power to you, you know? So, um, yeah, that really, you know, I just tried to get some of the core functionality where I was like, okay, what's kind of, um, you know, trying to put myself in their shoes a little bit, like what are the things people are going to care about? Um, and how do I, you know, just get those, those, um, those major use cases in where it's like, how do people interface with the app? Um, and, and kind of just extracting that to shortcuts as much as possible. Yeah. So what is the the next feature that you think that you're going to be looking at then? Is that something that you can uh, tell us or is it going to be one of those state oh, secrets oh, that you have to keep secret, secret until uh, it's released? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I so I just released like the big 2.0 update, um, which was like a huge amount of work to like add like iPad support and iCloud sync, um, charts, space ID, all these big things that people had been requesting for a while. So um, things are probably going to be quiet for a little bit just because that was a huge amount of work. Um, but yeah, I know one thing that's on my backlog um, for sure is Mac support, um, just with like Catalyst and stuff where I can um, 
basically you can kind of use like the iPad app as like a, um, a bridge to the Mac app. And so, um, yeah, I'm hoping to add support for that because I know like some people want to be able to enter expenses on their Mac. You know, it's kind of a natural place to maybe do some of your budgeting, especially when you're entering a bunch of things at once. So that's something to uh, keep an eye out for, for sure. That, that's actually the uh, question that I had about that. Um, what, because I think this is a question that is interesting for any, just to ask any developer. How do you personally um, hear people's suggestions for additions and features and how do you decide what gets chosen? I mean, are you the type of person because like Rosemary Orchard, I bet has, you know, if she were to create an app, she would have an automation set up to where every tweet about the app would go into a Google spreadsheet. And then you could check that Google spreadsheet that maybe gets sent to like an air table and you could check off features as they're, they're completed. I'm curious, do you do you just sort of hear uh, things from from different places and sort of catalog it in your brain of, okay, this seems to get the most votes? Or do you completely kind of ignore everything external and go with the features that you think you would want? And that then makes me wonder uh, if your partner suggests a feature, does that sort of get a higher rank than the rest of uh, <laughs> the rest of us out there? <laughs> yeah, so... Um... I think, so my partner actually is a very good like idea generator. I feel like that's been like a really interesting thing is he's, he'll always like, I'll be like eating breakfast or lunch or something. He'll come up and be like, I have an idea for nudge it. And I'm like, oh no, like <laughs> I don't need more <laughs> ideas. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's kind of, I'm probably not as organized as I should be about like getting feature requests in. Um, it's something where like, yeah, kind of like you said, we're like, you know, I'll, the problem is it's pulled in from all these different places. Like some people email me, some people tweet at me, some people um, DM me on like Instagram, right? Like it's like, it's it's kind mm -hmm. of this like um, ad hoc system I have where, you know, if I'm noticing kind of some, some of the like similar questions or similar uh, feature requests coming up, I'll kind of just make a note of that and pull it a little higher in my backlog for like a future release. Um, and then, yeah, there's definitely things that, you know, people don't request, but I'm like, hey, like, I kind of feel like this would make the experience experience better. Or like, um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing these similar comments and and maybe this other thing would actually solve those things better and, and kind of um, pull things together more. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a balancing act because, you know, there, <laughs> it's kind of like ridiculous, like the volume of feature requests you get as an app developer. And you obviously can't say yes to all of them. Right. And you can't, um, you know, you can't give everything like the time of day it deserves. And so it's definitely difficult to like prioritize, um, you know, what you're going to take on in the next update. Um, and so that's definitely been a difficult challenge for me is like, how do I, you know, how do I not upset users that are like really wanting this feature, right? But also be like, hey, I only have a certain amount of time. I am one person working on this, right? Um, so yeah, that's definitely been a learning opportunity for me. Absolutely. I, ca I can't imagine uh, trying to sort through uh, and and figure out what uh, what people want and then what it only seems like some people want and trying to figure out what really is the right feature request to make, especially if you kind of created the app for one purpose in the first place, then to 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 have that go out and, and become something else. It's kind of like a, an author who writes a book and it gets out there and, you know, they, those characters that people fall in love with and they uh, they they want to shape them in their own way or interpret things in their own way. Um, there's something a little scary about that kind of losing losing artistic license over your baby in a way uh, and having to, to to figure out what works for you and what is important to you while also uh, in, in the, in the case of an app, trying to figure out what other people want. Um, one other question that I wanted to, to discuss with you is, uh, your app getting featured in, in the app store. And so this I think is, um, a really exciting moment for any developer. Um, one would think, uh, to, to have their app kind of be honored in that way to say, Hey, this is an app that you should really check out. And, I, I, there are a few questions here that I have, and and you know the big one is, was this something that was even on your radar as having uh, any 
thought that you would possibly have this app be featured whenever you decided to set out and create it did you think that you know there was a chance that that at some point you would get featured in the app store and then just talk about kind of you know, I, I'm sure we can't go into to incredible detail because of the way that uh, Apple's editorial team works and stuff like that. But uh, if you can provide any detail on uh, what it's like to be featured, you know, one of the questions that I've always had, and I don't know if you can answer it, but if you can, I'd love to hear it, is what do, do, do they reach out to you and say, hey, create an artwork or do they create the artwork that's that's for the the you know, featured banner and how that process works. And if you ended up having to write more copy and that kind of thing uh, that led you to getting featured in the app store. So I know a lot of little questions and details, but I'd love (laughs) to hear it. Yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, to your first question, like, no, I definitely did not think that nudge it would be, you know, kind of where it is today um, where, you know, Apple's featuring it and it's like, you know, I think decently popular for an indie app, right? Um, And, you know, it it definitely started out as this project where I'm like, okay, well, I really want to make this nice polished thing and let's see if other people like it, right? Um, It was Mm -hmm. not, there was definitely no expectation that like this was going to be, you know, some like success or anything like that, right? So it's definitely been like a really big surprise um, for me to see people um, give it as much support as they've given it, um, it's been, yeah, just like the people are so nice and so sweet and, and just like have been super supportive of its development. Um, and yeah, that's definitely been a really nice surprise for me. Um, and not just users, right? Like Apple too. Like I feel like the, um, yeah, it's, it's been featured in like several places, but like the, the most recent one was like the actual banner at the top. Um, and Mm -hmm. yeah, basically like the process for that is like, um, when you, you can basically submit at any time. Like there's this form you can fill out on Apple's website to say, hey, please feature my app. And like, here's the reason you should feature my app, right? And you kind of have to pitch it to them. Um, Ah. And so, yeah, but I'm assuming like, as I get a million feature requests, I'm sure they also (laughs) get a million of these, right? Um, And so I I, I think it's something where um, because for, for this update, it was like such a big update, right? Like adding iPad support, adding charts, all of these things that people had asked for for a while. Um, and then also I think they like to, um, every once in a while, kind of like feature smaller teams and indie devs and stuff like that. They've been doing a lot more recently to kind of try to uplift and balance the playing field a little bit, right? Um, and so I think there is more of like a, a concerted effort there. Um, but yeah, so basically you just like submit this form and you're like, Hey, please feature me. And usually you don't hear back. (laughs) Um, (laughs) usually it's like, okay, I think I've submitted like six of them in the last like eight months or something like that. And, and, you know, I kind of just like submit one with each update and I'm kind of like, okay, well, it's part of my process. I just like submit one and then I know I'm not going to hear back. Right. Um, and then this time they emailed me and I was like, oh my gosh, like, am I actually like, I couldn't believe it at first. Right. Um, and yeah, basically you just like, they, they ask you to like submit this artwork. Um, and they give you kind of like a template file where you can like see like, what are the dimensions supposed to be? And they kind of give you suggestions about like, um, you know, if you want to include like certain copy or things like that. So, um, Uh, yeah, it's kind of a collaborative process a little bit where like they kind of give you some things and then they're like, here are our guidelines basically, right? Like try to follow this format. Um, and then you submit this artwork and they either like give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down and say, Hey, change these things. Right. Um, and yeah, it's super exciting though. I feel like the, just like the process of like trying to, um, create that artwork is also super interesting because like it's supposed to be kind of more like abstract, like it's supposed to show elements of your app, but not be like the interface. Right. And so with mine, I tried to like abstract away some of the chart information and like make it this cute little visual, but like, yeah, it's supposed to kind of spark interest, but not be like super, um, literal. Right. And so that's really difficult (laughs) to balance. Um, And especially when you're not an artist like me, um, it's very difficult because I'm not like an expert at this thing. So, yeah, it was definitely a challenge. Well, I have to say there's a a frustrating number of of folks out there who say, I'm not an artist. And then they create really good looking things. And um, I think that you you pulled it off. Uh, So, 
uh, whether or not that makes you an artist, I, I personally think it does. I think you did a great job. Um, yeah. Uh, Rosemary, do you have any other questions that you want to ask Sawyer before we let him go on his merry way and introduce all those feature requests I've asked for? <laughs> well, I'm going to give him a feature request as well. I just wanted to say um, thank you for all of the different currency options as artwork, because there are so many cur cur currencies out there which don't use the dollar sign. And this is one of my pet peeves with a lot of budgeting apps where, you know, you use it and you've got a choice of the dollar sign on the app or the dollar sign on the app. And that's pretty <laughs> much it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I love the fact I have pounds selected because I'm here, over here in the UK, but I could have krona, euro, won, yen or yuan. Um, but I do have a feature request. If you can generate especially midnight dollar fanned with all the other currencies, please. <laughs> that might not be uh, super great for uh, all of the mass rolling here but also the confetti at the bottom is super cute so uh, I just wanted to say thank you for the choice of app icons I know unfortunately if such when you port to the Mac then that feature is not something that will be so readily available um, because that's one of the limitations of Mac OS turns out that it's uh, it changing the app icon tends not to stick very well or at least it didn't last time I tried uh, but yeah thank you very much it's uh, a great app and I'm really enjoying using it Thank you so much. Yeah, the app icons are super fun. I spend way too much time like making like the seasonal ones and stuff like that. That's kind of just like a fun little outlet for me where I'm like, you know, I probably should be working on more important things, but I'm going to do this, you know. Um, <laughs> Productive so, yeah. procrastination. Exactly. Oh, yeah. the best way of doing things. I need to write that down. I never thought of it in that way. Productive procrastination. Uh, Sawyer, go. thank you so much for joining us today. If folks want to check out your app, uh, where do they go? And then if folks want to follow you online, where should they go to do that? Yeah, so um, I am at Sawyer Blatz on Twitter. Um, and you can follow Nudget on Twitter as well. It's at budget in Nudget. Um, or you can go to the website nudgetapp.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we do appreciate you taking some time today. Everybody should go check out the Nudget app uh, in the App Store and, uh, you know, sa save some money, spend some money and keep track of your money. Keep track of your budget. Thank you, Sawyer. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. All righty, folks, we're going to take a quick break so I can tell you about the very, very cool Babel. who are bringing you this episode of iOS today. Guten Tag, my name is Sergeant. In case you don't speak German, that means good day. My name is Sergeant. It might be a little weird, you know, because my name is Micah Sergeant, right? Uh, but I just said my last name. And that has to do with the way that German works in terms of formality and informality. And this is one of the things that I learned from Babbel, the number one selling language learning app. So that there are different forms of, of introducing yourself. There are different ways to do it depending on who you're talking to. And that's something that, you know, you might not have learned if you were just sort of going through words, learning different words and kind of building up your vocabulary. Uh, one of my goals for the new year was to learn a new language and or more than one language if I could. And of course, Babbel has made the whole process super fun, super easy. There are these just kind of short little lessons, uh, you'd call them bite size that you can use to learn in the real world. Um, so German for me, the reason why I chose uh, that as the language that I wanted to learn is because I am overwhelmingly German, genetically speaking. Um, my So the... I, my mom is Caucasian, uh, and so that's the Caucasian side of my family. Uh, my dad is African-American, and I'm about uh, – it's it's somewhere between sort of uh, 45, 55, um, sub-Saharan African being the 45 percent, and the 55 percent is uh, English, Irish, and German. And the kind of largest percentage of that is German. So it's a language that with and my last name, Sergeant, is uh, is a German last name. And so given that that has such a, a big part of my history and my family's history, that's the reason why I wanted to learn this language, but also because it's a really cool language uh, that can kind of build upon itself to create new concepts and words. So there are a whole bunch of reasons why German is cool. 
And, you know, that's just one of the one of the reasons why. So uh, Babbel's 15 minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. Yeah, you just need to spend 15 minutes. And unlike the infamous language classes you took in high school and some of you took in college, I remember my language classes in college, uh, Babbel designs their courses with practical real world conversations in mind. So it's going to be things that you use in everyday life. Beginners start with typical greetings like, hello, how are you? And build up to practical dialogues such as, how can I book a single room? Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel lessons were literally created by more than 100 language experts. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. You can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and as I am learning, German. Plus, Babbel has this really cool feature. It's it's a speech recognition technology so that you can improve your pronunciation and your accent. So it'll show you a word and then it will listen with the microphone once you give it permission and you say the word and it will say, good, you know, you, you, you pronounced it correctly or mm, try again. And that has been really helpful in making sure that I'm getting those pronunciation skills down. So start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you're going to get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code IOS today. I-O-S-T-O-D-A-Y. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com. Promo code IOS today for an extra three months free. Babbel. Language for life. Thanks so much to Babbel for sponsoring this week's episode of iOS Today and for helping me learn German. Yeah, it's very good. Um, all right, folks, let us move on to the news segment. Uh, up first, I think this is a really cool thing, Rosemary. Um, picture, picture this. You're walking along with your iPhone and you suddenly look and the darn thing's got a low battery notification. So you reach in. Uh, ah! So you reach into your bag and you pull out this uh, little wallet or card-shaped uh, pack and you just <laughs> magnet it to the back of the phone and suddenly you've got extra battery life right there in the in the sort of MagSafe charger. Yes, Bloomberg says that Apple is working on Mag's, a MagSafe battery pack for iPhone 12. And I think this is so clever, the way that this would be done, where it's just kind of like a, a little juice up pack that you can just magnet right there to the back of the phone. Yeah, I really love this. So as soon as they they came out with MagSafe, um, I had uh, the the iPhone event uh, back in uh, what was that September, October? Um, that was a long time ago, or it feels like a right? long time ago anyway. Um, and people were saying, "Oh yeah, MagSafe battery packs," and you know, it it was a logical step, but it's one of those things where you know they they do need to sit down and figure out you know how can they make this work and also deliver that performance we're expecting. I personally think this is a much better approach than what Apple's previously done with the battery pack cases because the problem with the battery pack cases is they're big and they're heavy and they're big did i mention that they're really big um and <laughs> then on top of that when when the battery in it is dead you've still got that case on your phone unless you have another case with you um and the beauty of this is you stick it on your phone when you need to charge it or if your friend needs to charge their phone, which hopefully you know we'll be seeing people again in the not too distant future, um, you can you can give this to them and they can put it on their device as well. Um, because I presume this will be much like the MagSafe wallet, which unfortunately I did not think to bring it um, here to show on camera, um, where you can you know just stick it on the back and it one one size will fit all phones. Now hopefully they will actually do a smaller one and a bigger one, um, but I love that this is hopefully actually properly going to be a thing. We've seen some magnetic battery packs pop up on Amazon, but they're not officially MagSafe compatible and they're from companies you might not have heard of before. Um, I don't think Anchor have officially said that they they have um, a MagSafe one. I think they have a magnetic battery pack. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, there's a key difference because a lot of people are working on these magnetic accessories which aren't necessarily MagSafe and therefore don't charge at those higher speeds that we're now used to with that magic pack. Yes, I think that you've uh, really pointed out the thing that folks have to pay attention to because I have been, uh, you know, had that question asked of me and then people will point to Anchor and some other companies that have magnetic devices, but they're not MagSafe 
compatible devices. So that's something to be very aware of as you are kind of looking about the um, the tech accessory ecosystem is whether or not it says, yes, I am um, MagSafe compatible. But this is a this is a neat product. I hope it's not going to cost an arm and a leg, um, as some of <laughs> Apple's other charging devices do. Uh, Possibly just the forearm, Micah. Not the not the entire arm, just the forearm. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. That's good to know. Um, let's see what else do we have. Oh yes, um, so the European Union um, is so so they've, they've kind of been a. a a lot of things going on right now in the EU. Um, first was uh, App- Apple kind of being looked at for some antitrust concerns. Um, and these came a while back. Uh, and then they were exacerbated recently with Epic Games issuing its own antitrust complaint against Apple. And as the EU uh, starts to look into what's going on, uh, the European Commission VP uh, told Apple, um, hey, you, you, need to, you need to treat all apps equally, okay? And so I find this interesting, you know, as a, as a sort of early an early, it's not a ruling. It's not anything like that. It's kind of just, a, Hey, we're about to look into this and we're going to, you know, get some information. And so you should just know, you should definitely treat apps equally. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on this? Cause I just, I just find it fascinating. This sort of, it, it feels very, um, it, it feels, it feels very, uh, unserious, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what other way to put it. It's just like your arms akimbo and you look down at Apple and you say, now, listen, you need to play fairly. Okay. And that's, that's the extent of things. I don't know that that, of course, the company knows it needs to play fairly. I don't know. What do you think? How do you feel about this? (laughs) Well, I, I kind of feel that it is to an extent, a little unfair that Apple's apps don't have to have you know it's it's um you know the these tracking things pop up and so on and it's it's similar with you know that health check that we see in the app store that we talked about a couple of episodes ago where it's it's in the app store and you can see but maybe it's not always right and that's a whole other thing um and i think the the, the thing is is apple's there going well we know what we're doing we're not tracking user information so it's okay and I, I get that. And as far as things go, if there is any company that isn't going to ask me for you know permission to do things like that, you know, I would rather it be Apple than Facebook. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, it would be much better if we if everybody just knew, oh, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm using the Maps app and it would like to look at my location. Uh, well, yes. OK, a map does need to see my location to, for it to work and things like that. And it's about this this tracking information specifically where it's looking um, for ad tracking purposes and Apple's own ad tracking purposes are based on your device identifier and not your Apple ID or anything else. So you get a new iPhone, it starts over figuring out what it should show you ad wise. That's things like the app store and stuff like that. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, they do need to play fairly. And I think, you know, on the one hand, it sounds ridiculous, any governing body going, Oh, look, you need to behave. Um, (laughs) but at the same time, if they can say, look, if you don't do this, then we are going to go ahead and do, you know, that go through the proceedings and make you do this. Mm-hmm. It saves a lot of time for everybody, probably a lot of legal fees um, mm. and stuff like that, just to you know skip all of that and go, look, if you don't play fairly, we will go ahead and do the thing that you don't want us to do that's going to cost you time and money, that's going to cost us time and money. Can you just do it? It's Yeah, so on the one hand, it sounds ah. ridiculous. On the other hand, I totally see the benefit for everybody because you know, do you really want to pay lawyers way more fees than you need to in this particular case? I'm sure they have better things to do. That's a really you bring up a good point there um, to to say we don't yeah we don't want to go forward with this uh, unless we have to so that makes more sense that makes me feel a lot better about what otherwise kind of felt like a not serious um, <laughs> conversation uh, or or warning there um, so yeah thank you for clearing that up for me because I was feeling very weird about that whole idea. <laughs> Um, a developer recently was complaining on, on Twitter about, um, their app kind of not only being, so, so they created an app for the Apple watch that was a a keyboard app. So you could type on it 
and the app was not long after kind of copied and uh, copied in such a way that the the new app that was created did not have all of the features of this developer's app. And it charged a ridiculous amount of money um, and ended up kind of getting kind of climbing the ranks in the app store anyway, uh, despite the fact that it didn't do what it claimed it could do. And so this kind of led to a conversation about app store scams and uh, the app store having apps that are uh, attempting to rip people off, essentially. Well, uh, there's some interesting stuff in the uh, in the waves uh, about some apps getting rejected for, quote, irrationally high prices. Uh, so Apple may be responding to the, you know, concerns and complaints that have been taking place uh, in a way that attempts to cut back on the number of apps that are uh, essentially just ripping people off. Because I've come across a few apps that have, uh, you know, tried to charge per week as opposed to per month or per year, you know, annually or monthly versus weekly. And so this app, um, and again, this is, you know, alleged, uh, it, it mirrors some of the language that's in Apple's own App Store guidelines, App Store review guidelines. So uh, it says, this is the, the letter of rejection sent to the developer who tried to submit their app. Uh, Customers expect the App Store to be a safe and trusted marketplace for purchasing digital goods. Apps should never betray this trust by attempting to rip off or cheat users in any way. Unfortunately, the prices you've selected for your app or in-app purchase products in your app do not reflect the value of the features and content offered to the user. Charging irrationally high prices for content or services with limited value is a ripoff to customers and is not appropriate for the App Store. And it goes on to detail kind of what uh, the prices are and what items ended up costing that much and how these things could be resolved. So this is an interesting thing because... We've got two situations here, one that's good and one that's, you know, like, uh oh, the the good thing is that folks don't end up downloading apps and then unexpectedly getting charged each week for something that, you know, they didn't expect because they weren't paying attention was going to be charging them each week. But it does make me wonder, how does an app store decide what is or is not? of that level of value because i remember an app that had i think it was like a hundred dollar in-app purchase to unlock this feature that would let you shoot 4k video at a time when 4k video uh on the iphone was not as uh readily available and it was you know some pro version of this pro app for uh video recording and you could make the argument that a feature that you know it it turned it flipped on or off a switch essentially was not worth the cost that they were charging so how does one make the judgment on what is of limited value versus what is of uh, the value that the the developer sets so i think this is this is going to be something that it is uh, a potential point of contention for developers. Uh, but I do like the idea of helping to cut back on scam apps taking advantage of users. Yeah, I think this is a very difficult one for Apple to balance just because there are some cases where you might genuinely want to buy a product for a week. So um, one of the ones that I could think of is, say, App in the Air or or TripIt or Flightly, um, you know, any kind of travel tracking application. You could genuinely want to buy that for two weeks at a time or a week at a time if you've got a week of travel coming up. You know, you could buy it for that week. So it makes perfect sense to allow for things like weekly subscriptions. Um, But I think one of the things that Apple has to be careful of here is that race to the bottom that we have seen with app prices. You know, Nudget, which we talked about at the top of the show, $3.99, that's really, really cheap as far as budgeting app goes versus something like you need a budget, which is, I believe, $80 a year. Well, where do you where do you draw the line there? Is eighty dollars a year reasonable, or is four dollars 
one-time purchase reasonable. Um, and, you know, if, if Apple starts making decisions of apps in this category, uh, you know, a budgeting app cannot charge more than $100 a year, does that mean we're going to see all of those apps priced at $99.99? Um, or does that mean that, you know, we will still see price variation and they're not going to do this based on an, an average or, or a median price? Um, so it's it's going to be a challenge for Apple to do here. That said, anything that charges you know a thousand dollars for a feature, I think probably needs you know some review um, because that's that's something where uh, it seems like a lot of money to be putting uh, on something that is virtual that can be taken away if the the app developer decides to pull the app from the App Store, for example. Um, so Knox Harrington from the chat has reminded us of an app in the app store that um, came about in uh, 2008 and this app was called i am rich and this app lets you it costs 999 dollars and i think 99 cents so a thousand bucks and <laughs> what would happen is if you bought this app then it would display a glowing red gem and an icon that when pressed displayed the following mantra in large text. I am rich. I deserve it. I am good, healthy, and successful. Uh, this app, available for $999.99, was taken down on August 6th, 2008. So a day after it had been uh, released into the App Store. But before it was released, eight people bought the application. Eight people spent a thousand dollars on this app um well that means that's... apple got three thousand three hundred and thirty three dollars and thirty three cents for each of those purchases very good <laughs> point um so <laughs> this is uh this was then there were some other apps that were released um that, that came out after that, that that did the same thing. Uh, they didn't provide very much value, but they just were, I guess, a way for you to show that you were wealthy. Um, and so it says, in 2009, a developer created an app called I Am Richer, which was published in the Google Play Store. The cost of the app was $200. Uh, the same developer released an app called I Am Rich LE, which was just $9.99. Um, it also, <laughs> along with Who the mantra... Who doesn't need a light edition of this? <laughs> right. Along with the mantra, it had a calculator and a, quote, help system. So, hey, uh, Have they you heard know, it added Nudget? more features. Yeah. <laughs> they should definitely... Um, Nudget is still what? winning here. It's $4 and it's got emojis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, let's see. Uh, so... <laughs> I don't know. Now I'm, now I'm lost in that. But it is good that Apple is cracking down on apps that are um, trying to essentially scam users. Um, iOS 14.5 adds more than 200 new emoji to iPhone, including a reworked headphone emoji that now looks like the AirPods Max. And I don't know about you, Rosemary, but I zoomed in on that uh, it, that headphones emoji and it is incredibly detailed it's it the... is i love it uh the only thing i'll say is where's the case come on <laughs> come on apple they're embarrassed of their case they don't want to have anything to do with that they're like oh, i mean it's let's right here it works it it's on my airpods max uh you know it's it's it, it covers the part that doesn't really need protecting as much but you know <laughs> it, it exists they they could have had a, a headphones and a headphones in cover in a, in a cover I'm, I'm sure jeremy birch um founder of emojipedia will be right on that uh at some point yeah but yes where's the, where's the covered <laughs> version of this uh but there are, yeah there are more than 200 new emoji that are going to be coming in ios 14.5 uh including a person in a steam room uh and a heart that's on I believe fire that's person exhaling uh, the one on the right right is a person exhaling but the one on the left looks like ah. a person in a steam room yes yes it's facing clouds i believe is the official name of it oh I and on clouds i wonder what is it supposed to mean do you think I, I'm guessing this is related to vaping slash the amount of condensation that comes out of your mask. <laughs> I like it because I was more thinking lost in the clouds, sort of blearily unaware. Uh, I mean, it's not possible. Blissfully. It's been pretty chilly recently, I, I hear, for most people. So that thing that where you breathe and you can see your, your breath like a dragon. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then 
the syringe emoji no longer is bloody uh, because folks have been wanting to use it to talk about getting a vaccine. And if you've got blood in the vaccine, then it doesn't quite work. Um, plus some other options for uh, different relationships, different couples that are together. So, yeah, um, that's that's that. I, I think folks really like to uh, update their phones to get the new emoji. And so oftentimes Apple will uh, pair those new emoji updates with important security and privacy updates to make sure that uh, at the same time you're getting new emoji, you're also improving upon your phone's security. Tried and tested. Uh, it works. There you go. And last but not least, I uh, wanted to mention that the Microsoft Office app is available for the iPad. This is an app that is essentially a universal app. So it, it has all of the different Office apps within one app. So you download the one app and then you can do your, I almost said Keynote, but that's not what it's called, PowerPoint, your Microsoft Word, and your spreadsheet application. Excel is what it's called. Uh, you can you can use all of those in the Microsoft Office app for iPad. So if you've been waiting to have one app to rule them all and you are a Microsoft Office user, then get happy because it's here uh, and available for you in the App Store. All right, let us move on to the feedback. Our first topic for feedback uh, why don't you read this one for us, Rosemary? Well, Brian from Cincinnati has written in and he said he's getting ready to buy an iPad to use as a computer, which it is. It's a computer. So congratulations. You're not using it as a computer is one. I'm pretty sure I can do everything a computer can do for the most part, except I haven't figured out how I can install extensions on the web browsers. Do you have any suggestions? So I've got good news for you, Brian. You actually don't need uh, browser extensions on iOS because they're called apps. Um, and I am just going to pop open my iPad right here. And so if you're on the video version, then you can see I'm in the settings section of my iPad. So I, I'm here and there's a Safari section. And to start with, if you scroll down, then you can have a look. You can change your search engine and things like that here. Um, and Safari suggestions is also there, which is a great option. There's also... Um, some some other things. So if we scroll down here, then we can see content blockers. Now, content blockers will only appear if you have an app installed that can do content blocking. I personally use one blocker, which is a great app. There's many other choices out there. And if you have that, then you can enable those right there. Um, and then um, there's there's some other options down here as well. So, you know, showing icons and tabs and things like that. Not necessarily something you would use a plugin for, but something you could use a plugin for. However, the way that you are going to want to do most of your, your browser extension work is actually in Safari itself, and that is through the share sheet menu. So if I tap on the share sheet and it shows up, sorry, I'm using a mouse and it's being a little wonky. Um, then if I scroll across here, you can see that there's all sorts of things. So instead of an Instapaper plugin, I have Instapaper through the share sheet. Instead of a NetNewsWire plugin to grab the RSS feeds, I have a NetNewsWire extension. Um, and those are specific apps. And then if we scroll down a little further, then we can see other options like adding bookmarks and things like that. But there's one password and so on right here. Um, there's also one blocker for blocking specific elements, things like Apollo, a great Reddit application. However, I did double check with Brian because browser extensions can cover an entire range of things. Um, and specifically what he was after here was an, a browser extension, which uh, he would get bonus points from his points program if he uses it. And that is one of the few things that you can't do on iOS. Um, things like um, points programs, uh, money back, voucher things, they don't exist as extensions uh, on iOS, unfortunately. Uh, so in general, usually there's a points application or something where if you go through that, it'll give you a referral link to do whatever it is to get the bonus points. Um, but there, there is no specific extension for that. But there's plenty of ways to do extensions in general. Nice. So there you go. I, I think that... Um, it increasingly, it's not as difficult as it once was to replace your uh, computer with an iPad, which is kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, all right. Our next question is Jeff from Tamarack, Florida. Uh, Jeff says, I'm using a 10.5 inch iPad Pro running iPadOS 14.5 Beta 2. 
I've noticed with the last two betas that when opening a private tab in Safari, it also shows all the tabs that were open before requesting the private session. Excuse me. It also shows all the tabs that were open before uh, open before requesting the private session. There we go. Previously, these tabs weren't visible when in private mode. Personally, I liked it better this way. It makes me wonder if its privacy features are even working, or are they working just for the new tab? Do you think this was an in? Do you think this was intentional by Apple, or is it a glitch? Thanks for any information you can offer. Uh, so, uh, Jeff, I believe that you. Maybe mis misremembering. Uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, there have been a number of times where if you go into Safari, you know, you launch Safari on your uh, iPhone, iPad, whatever it happens to be, and you tap the little uh, tab icon in the bottom uh, right corner of, on the iPhone, for example, and you choose private, if you had uh, previous pages open, in the session, then they will reappear. That was that's the case for me. Those uh, different tabs will reappear. Um, what it what it doesn't do is keep that information outside of that very particular session. So you can kind of think of it as um, let's. Let, I've got to come up with some sort of a, 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 a visual here. So I walk over to a sandbox and I take my trowel and I dig out a square within the sandbox. And inside of it, I put these little toys. And each of these toys is a different browser tab that I have open. And so now I've got, you know, six toys in, I don't know why I held up four fingers, six toys <laughs> in my little square within the sandbox. And nothing outside of that square can see those toys that are inside of that square. They don't know what it is. There's no connection to those things. But if I walk away and come back, that square is still there and those toys are still in that square. It's just that nothing else is can see what it is, can gain access to it. So it's kind of like just, you know, tossing aside that that session for a, for a second and then you can come back to it. So you do have to go through and remove those tabs if you want to. Um, so basically what I'm saying is I don't believe this is a new feature. Um, and I can say this based on personal experience and also uh, one time when I was helping a family member uh, with something you know, go switching to the private browser, it popped open like 12 tabs that they had had open before in the private browser. And so this, and this is a family member who is an everyday user, not a developer, not even a public beta user. Um, and I remember that very clearly in my head, that situation. So it is not something new in the privacy features and the private browsing mode is still as you expect it to be. It's not, that those pages are saved anywhere else other than in that session itself. So they're not getting saved to your history. They're not getting you know access that way. It's just in that little box, they're there. Um, but Rosemary, I'm curious, do you have any, other than just simply swiping to close those tabs after you're done with the private browsing session, is there like a shortcut for private browsing? Oh, mode yeah. Or anything like that? There, well, there's not necessarily a shortcut for private browsing mode, but if you're in Safari, and this works on the iPhone as well as the iPad, and you tap and hold uh, the tab icon, that's the two squares on top of each other. Now, I'm doing this on my iPad, so I've got the option to merge all my windows here. But below that, I can see close this tab, and then underneath that, I can close all three tabs. And I just have to confirm, and boom, all three of those tabs are closed. And then I'm left with one tab, which has got my favorites and stuff on. Don't worry, that's that's normal. This is my default page. Um, and I can swipe that away as well. Um, and then down here at the bottom, I can still see my tabs that are open on other devices and open them here in private browsing mode. Um, but then if I switch back to regular Safari, then I can see my regular session information right here, including uh, the iOS Today site. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's a great thing. So long press on that tabs icon and close all tabs. And that should uh, solve your problem there, Jeff. But yes, uh, nothing new here, nothing changed. This is a feature that's been around uh, for a while. All right, moving on to David. 
Uh, David writes in, in a recent episode, maybe the last two weeks in January or the first two weeks in February, Michael and Rosemary, Michael, who's Michael? Oh, Micah, Micah and Rosemary made mention (laughs) of an app that gave the rudiments of simple coding. I have searched the program notes to find the name of that app, but cannot find a mention of it. Could you give me its name? Thanks, David. I don't know about you, Rosemary, but I'm thinking he's talk uh, that they're talking about Swift Playgrounds. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty certain that that uh, David's asking about uh, Swift Playgrounds here. I've got Swift Playgrounds open on my iPad if you're viewing the video version. Um, and uh, basically, it's this little sort of game that you go through and it, it teaches you how to run functions and things like that. So if I pop into the next one, Portal Practice, I'm running this on a 16 gigabyte iPad mini, which is running out of storage space. So unfortunately, this is not going to show. Uh, if I switch back to a previous lesson, then uh, I might get the preview. No. Okay. Uh, well, there we go. There we go. So now I can see, uh, you know, this is what I have to do. I have to get my little uh, little person here around to the gem, collect the gem, get him around to the switch and then toggle the switch. And I've been taught so far how to move forwards, how to turn left, how to collect a gem and how to toggle a switch. Um, and uh, also when I tap into uh, my code here, uh, if I add a new line at the bottom, then I can uh, have another option for turn left and then I can just run it. And uh, he should... Go on a little walk, go around, collect a gem. He's going quite slowly. I'll see if I can speed him up a little bit. And uh, yeah, there we go. Ta-da, fantastic. Apparently I did everything right. So Nice. Yeah, so this is, and we talked about this too, David. Um, while it may seem on the face of it a, uh, a, a game or a, a developer, excuse me, wow, an app that is made for kids or, or younger folks. It's not, that's not necessarily the case. I've learned uh, quite a bit from Swift playgrounds, frankly. Um, so you should definitely check it out regardless of the kind of um, youthful illustrations and animations. I think that anybody can learn something from it. All right. It is time for the app caps. Folks, it is time for our app cap segment. <laughs> if I'd known you were going feline today, I would have got out my cat ears, Micah. This is the part of the show where we honor our app picks of the week. These are the apps we are using, we love, uh, whether they're new apps to us or apps we've used for a long time. They're the apps we want to share with you. And so we don app caps in honor of our app picks of the week. And today I am wearing a tiger on my head, uh, I suppose in honor of my alma mater. I think that's how you say that. I said the school yes. that you went to is your alma mater. Yes, uh, the University of Missouri, Mizzou, go Tigers, uh, right here. And you, Rosemary Orchard, tell me about your hat. I am wearing a pink sombrero that came in the box of party hats that I ordered uh, over Christmas to make sure I had a selection of hats available for iOS today. And I'm very pleased. This one is pink and it's got some little white trim with some pom-poms on it. I'm sure it's not uh, a proper sombrero. Um, I'm, I'm very certain it was very cheaply made, but it's very colorful and pretty. And that's what I wanted for today. Nice. Colorful and pretty. Tell me about your app pick of the week. Well, my app pick of the week is... Kitty Letter. Now, Kitty Letter is from the creators of the popular card game Exploding Kittens, where you are in attempting to make sure that you are not the person who explodes the kitten at the end of the game. So that, that might give you an idea as to what kind of game this is. But this is a digital game. It's not an in-person game. But you can play multiplayer. I'm going to pop into the single player mode. Uh, and there's two options. There's the arcade mode and the, the story mode. And I'm so far going on with uh, arcade mode. Essentially, you have a house and uh, it goes through a little story as a back uh, as a background, which I'll just skip for now. And uh, you have to try and uh, make letters um, with um, th- with uh, with this. And I'm I'm probably not going to do very well now. And my cats are not going to go over to the other people's house and and explode them. Um, so I'll just add pie just to uh, send some more cats over there. Um, and uh, Pip maybe. And 
Yeah, and pie. There we go. And so the idea <laughs> is that you create words, um, and you are trying to um, to do this as well as you can. And I'm I'm doing really badly because I'm talking at the same time here. Um, but basically, you need to send cats to to block their cats from coming, and the cats will then explode. And uh, if if you win, then uh, you, your house is not exploded; their caravan is exploded. Um, so I'm going to do quite badly here, I think, um, today. Um, but there we go. Um, it, it's a great game. It's uh, fun. Um, and that's a German word, so that does not work. Um, but there we go. <laughs> so uh, yes, I'm, I, I, I'll, I'll uh, save that for later. Um, but it's a great game. It's very fun. I was playing this a bit last week. It's a, it's a recent launch uh, and it's free. So, you know, give it a go if you would uh, like to uh, try to n- explode somebody else's cats virtually. Please don't explode actual <laughs> cats. They, no. they dislike it. They will claw at you. And um, that's not surprising. But basically, you're, you're, building uh, words out of the letters that they give you. As you go up, it gives you more letters, which is easier, but also more complex because the opponent, which if you're playing in multiplayer is an actual person, if you're playing in single player, it's the AI, um, will uh, create longer words. And longer words obviously create more cats. It's words with enemies, it says, instead of words with friends. I like it. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm going to have to download that app. For sure, I find myself downloading pretty much every app that you recommend during the app cap segment if I don't already have it. Um, so it's always fun to get new apps. Now, my app today, I'm actually stealing uh, from Leo Laporte. He shared this app on uh, MacBreak Weekly earlier in the week as the Mac counterpart to what I have downloaded on my iPhone. Um, so there are loads of different ad blockers out there and loads of different tracking blockers out there. And if you are on iOS, there are lots of privacy protections in place that Apple has added uh, and will continue to add in later versions of iOS. But one of the things that still pops up are the, instead of ads, it's the nags. It's the uh, cookie reminders. It's the, hey, you're using an ad blocker reminders. It's all those other kind of interstitials that get in the way of what you're doing. And I have yet to find an app that does a good job of removing those things unless I create it custom in something like one blocker where I go through and kind of try to find those things. Um, but a developer has created an app uh, called Hush Nag Blocker that's available completely for free. No in app purchases, nothing like that. And what you do is you install it on your uh, iOS device and you turn it on for Safari. Uh, it's, a, it's a Safari extension on the Mac. Um, so it's it's using the new tools for that. And it is a, um, a normal Safari extension on the uh, iPhone and iPad. You turn this thing on and it stops your data from being, uh, or excuse me, it stops those stupid nags from popping up, uh, which is just really nice. So it's so simple, again, free, completely free, uh, but it makes it so that you don't have to be bothered by those annoying pop-ups that come along with uh, your browsing of the web. So those are nags to accept cookies, um, and then it also does some tracking protections for you if you need them. Um, I use other tools for that, but just for the ability to, uh, to stop those stinking cookie pop-ups and, um, sending you these little notifications like push notifications and stuff all get in the way. This keeps that from happening. So I love it. Hush the noiseless browsing app available on the App Store for the Mac, the iPhone, the iPad for free. And Great choice there, Micah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of another episode of iOS Today. Folks, if you have uh, questions, feedback, a poem that you want to write for us, uh, anything like that, then you can send it to iOS Today at twit.tv, iOS today at twit.tv. That way we get your questions, we get your feedback, and we can be sure to uh, try to answer it on the show. Now, the show records live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, And so you can tune in live if you want to hang out with us while we record the show. But the best way to get the show is by going to twit.tv slash iOS. 
By doing that, you can subscribe to the show in any of the formats that are available. Uh, so Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, etc. Um, we are on all the places in both audio and video formats. This show is uh, particularly video friendly, but we do try to do our best to uh, for the audio listeners out there to describe what's going on on screen. So yeah, you can subscribe in any of those formats and uh, you should have an enjoyable show. And by the way, shout out to Anthony, um, not only our technical director, but also the editor uh, who has crafted some incredible thumbnails for us uh, for iOS today. There he is. Um, the, they've, they've been really fantastic lately and we appreciate it. Uh, Rosemary Orchard, if folks want to follow you online and keep up with the work you're doing, where do they go to do that? Uh, the best place is rosemaryorchard.com where you can find links to all of the things that I do. And, uh, of course, I'm at Rosemary Orchard on Twitter. Uh, where can people find you, Micah? You can find me. I don't know why I wanted to sing, but I'm online. Um, at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the social things. Or you can head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the different places I exist uh, and on the internet. And yeah, I think that's going to do it for us for this week. So thank you so much to tuning in to another episode of iOS Today. Goodbye. Sometimes the news of the week is best told by the people making and breaking it. And that is the essence of Tech News Weekly. Join me, Jason Howell, along with my co-host, Micah Sargent, as we interview the people who are breaking the news that you're probably already talking about. Plus, sometimes we actually get the people who are making the news, the people behind the story. That's Tech News Weekly on Twit.tv. Twit.tv.